coming up on Chopper's Politics. Do you talk to your plants? <laughs> Sometimes. Well, I actually do. The first thing I usually do when I get in How are you? is water my plants. What do you say to Check them? how they are. <laughs> uh, they've probably been absolutely fine, so they're with my two cats. Hello and welcome to Chopper's Politics. I'm Christopher Hope, the Associate Editor for Politics at the Daily Telegraph. And this week, listeners, I'm taking a break. The sun is out and my deck shoes are on. But before I left Telegraph Towers last week, I planted the seed of this brilliant podcast for you listeners. And by now it's grown with the help of Louisa Wells, our brilliant producer, into a strapping oak tree of news I know you'll love. Later in the show, we'll hear from Rick Parry, the chairman of the English Football League, or EFL, to talk about how the beautiful game can kickstart Michael Gove's levelling up. But first, last week I made a short journey in Westminster to the DEFRA building to speak to the Minister for the Environment, Rebecca Powell, the gardening minister to you and me. And once we'd taken root in her plant-filled office, OK, that's the last gag about gardening in this podcast, I started by asking Ms Powell what more you and me can do to help the government reach its net zero target by 2050. Well, we've had a lot of focus on setting law, you know, to reduce net zero by 2050. And we've got policies right across government departments to work on that, to reduce emissions, to keep us within 1.5 degrees of warming. And that, as you know, was the entire focus of COP26, which Alok Sharma presided over so successfully. And in fact, that our year is still continuing. But what I think from my perspective is very exciting about what more we can do is we've managed to bring that nature message in because the other side of the net zero story is how we use biodiversity in nature to help regulate the ecosystem. And it's absolutely critical. So we've got to do both. When you say get... we, that's the government, you're the government. Well, I what about listeners? We, what can... I mean we. Me well, and I know the, you're a big gardener. And, me and the people out there, you know. Yeah, so, what can you, what... What, what, so what that means is we actually genuinely can all play our part in growing more. Mm. Uh, it doesn't matter how big or small your patch is, or even if you have a community patch. I went to a great place in Walthamstow where they did community gardening and on every verge quite recently. And you can fill it with as many plants as possible. And I think one of the keys, if you're a gardener, I do it in my own garden, is to have plants covering the whole year. You can actually have cover in your garden for the whole year. And if you can, extend the flowering season for as long as possible. So actually, and I plant a great many bulbs in my garden. I call it cheats gardening, really, because yes. you do the work back in the autumn and then you reap the benefits for months. Of I mean, course. I have bulbs flowering from January to May mm. and you can dot them all over your garden or even put them in tubs and containers or balconies. And so the more things you can have that start to flower very early for the pollinators and yes. the insects more creepy crawlies that come insects. out early so that they've got some food... And actually, I genuinely have noticed in my own garden, I do think this does make a difference to the insect populations that we can help. So we can all do that. We want on a big scale as government to encourage farmers to do it. A lot of good work's already done, but we need to do a great deal more. But as individuals, we can also play our part. And the thing that those plants are doing, A, they are taking in our carbon dioxide, aren't they, and then releasing oxygen. But they're also, help, they have a cooling facility because the plants cover the ground, they're quite cooling. Yes. Uh, but they're also really helpful in tackling the extremes of weather that we get because of climate change. So we're getting more extreme rainfall. I mean, everybody will be noticing yeah, that. Yeah. More drying spells. But when we get the extreme rainfall, the plants help to take in the water and it goes down into the soils and the soil can help hold it. So it's not necessarily all rushing off down the streets mm. into the drains, causing overflows. That is one of the causes of some Do of our incidents. Do you stop to view maybe creepy crawlies as their, as their friends? Yes. So stop using... Um, yeah, please love an insect. Yeah. I mean, love an insect. I mean, and what's quite strange is over the last decade, and you've probably noticed it, Chris, people sort of came to hate insects. Yeah. They Why wanted is to this? kill them and spray them and swat them. And um, all sorts of sprays and chemicals came out to kill them. Have you um, banned them in your house? Or do you have fly killer? No, I don't use fly killer. I, I did grow up on a dairy farm, and I do remember, and it's quite disgusting. We used to have those fly papers hanging in the kitchen because oh, yes. our kitchen was full of flies from the dairy cows. Yes. Um, but. But but actually, even f even flies do a good service. You know, all of these insects they also help to break down material. You know, so they help with that cycle of life in the soil uh, or in your compost heap. 
We actually mm. genuinely do need them. And we do know that we've got a big crash in species. It's very stark, and it's particularly stark in this country. Because of the way that we've developed, we've got a very big population. Our farming actually has been very successful, but it's actually become quite intensive. Mm. And we've had methods of farming that have encouraged chemical control and sprays and pesticides. And, and you know, that's what the farmers were encouraged to do back in the 50s and 60s when we were so feeding it, the people. It's adjusting but it's that a bit of a revolution now that we're going through in order yeah. that we can get back these insects because we realise now they're such an important part of life, not just in that breaking down of materials, but also the pollinating a facility that that, that and, they do and rewilding will help that. that some well, point. I call it renaturing. Renaturing. I right. just say more nature. More everywhere, nature. Everywhere. From our gardens outwards, yes. our cities, towns, villages, yes. uh, and and I think that's the way to look at it. And we've actually set a policy now, a legal a legal target. Uh, to halt the decline of species abundance by 2030 hmm. uh, and hopefully increase it then after that. Are those the, are these meaningful things? I mean, it's so far away. Well, no, you asked me about uh, at the beginning about net zero and emissions. You know, the reason that we're moving on and tackling net zero is because we made it law and we brought it into policy. So now we've got policy, we've got targets and 2030 isn't very far away. And I'm I am the nature recovery minister. You are. So like no pressure. You know, I've got I, I'm determined that we will achieve this. There are lots of things we can do at home, as well as the all the cover of the plants. Mow your lawn less. You know, people used to be obsessed with their lawns, didn't they, in making them look like bowling greens. You don't need to do that. You could have a patch like that. And in fairness, if you have one patch like that and other patches where the grass is longer, it really sets it off really nicely. So I've got a little um a little very mini glade I planted in honour of my mother-in-law who died, Mary Clark, who herself was a great gardener. And I've planted some small um, fastidget trees, which are like a pear shape, fastidget hornbeams. They're really pretty. They're a great garden tree. A few quite choice, small pillar-like conifers and three small silver birches. And around them, I'm letting the grass grow and I've planted bulbs within it. But even in the seeds that were already in my lawn I'm seeing some really nice plants coming up in the in the grass even plantains which people used to hate and spray I like you know and um, achillea and bugle bugle again is brilliant for insects even buttercups and and do do you talk to your plants (laughs) sometimes well I actually do yes Um, Prince Charles used to didn't he he did I and I take my hat off to Prince Charles I do because I'm my husband very sadly died Yes, very recently, and so I do find myself at home talking a to bit plants. by myself, and I do actually talk to my plants, and because when I get home, no one's watered them, so the first thing I usually do when I get in, how are you, is water my plants. What do you say? To check them? how they are. <laughs> uh, they've probably been absolutely fine, so they're with my two cats. Of course, um, of but course. I do, yeah, I do. I give them a stroke, and the other day I put. My uh, anthuriums, I've got one of these on my desk in front of us here. Yes. They're lovely anthuriums, by the mm-hmm. way. Yes. Um, I think I actually bought that one at Chelsea Flower Show last year. I put them outside because there was a nice storm of rain coming. So I gave them a little outside experience. So there's a, great, there's a therapeutic quality to plants too. People should learn to love their plants in that way. I genuinely, honestly think there is a massively, massively therapeutic angle to plants in um, just communing with nature as a whole. And we've got lots of data now that actually proves that. And I think lockdown did really prove that to a lot of people and an awful lot of people. I think just they noticed the nature around them, mm. you know, some for the first time. You know, I love being the environment minister. It is one of my greatest achievements in my whole life, and I'm so pleased to be doing it, helping to make a difference. But one of my other greatest achievements was is is having created yes. my garden with my husband. It's also an artwork. Mm. It helps you with your grief. So it reminds you of reminds you of him. Yes, it's so calming. So if if you um, just go outside, and I just go outside, and I might do some work in my vegetable garden, weeding. I might feel low. And I just, I could just sit about moping or even crying, but, and I might do that a bit, but, Mm. you know, I just think, okay, get outside, Rebecca. And as soon as I do that and I'm immersed in what I'm doing, it's just so helpful Mm. and beneficial. It's calming. And you also, it gives you a greater perspective on life. Mm. You think, and my husband's up there in the graveyard. Mm. And so he's there with nature and our garden is literally, you can see it from the graveyard. 
and I go out there and I just I do feel part of something greater mm. when I'm in my garden and in nature and I do also feel that you know, hopefully I'm doing something helpful as well because all these creatures, and I saw a missile thrush for the first time in ages the other day and I do garden for wildlife so I don't use pests. I do do all these areas of wild bits. I've got a wildflower area, my COP26 mini meadow I created <laughs> I'm I, and I do a particular regime where I don't cut things down on the whole until February. So I don't do the winter cut down because the insects uh, can shelter there in the winter so they're great places for hibernating insects and um, I genuinely think it does help. Where do you find this knowledge? You're formerly a gardening journalist weren't you in the old days? You know know all these names. I know nothing about gardening. I like gardening. I I like it but I often wonder for example just look at crops. I have very little idea when crops are in season. I mean people want to reduce the food miles of food but I don't really know when carrots are are available. Are they all year round Rebecca Powell? I don't know. I mean well I think you've hit on something really important. I don't important. really know. And I should uh, know. I'm, I'm 50 years you old. Don't know. You write for the Telegraph. I know. <laughs> you ought to know. <laughs> the thing is, although I say I've always loved gardening, it wasn't really until I started, I then started doing this series for Channel 4 called Loads More Muck and Magic, which is the first ever, I think, an only organic gardening programme on telly. But um, I then started interviewing people like like you're doing now every single week going to their gardens and I then tasked myself with really learning about it so I wrote things down and mm. I learned about the names and then I did it at home I kept mm. a little book of all the things I thought were the best things and I, I one by one I introduced them into my own garden I made loads of loads of mistakes and planted things at the wrong time and or they died and all of that but you learn by doing that and in fairness what I would say is don't be scared of it just go out because I would say even now you know go to a local garden centre buy a few packets of seeds buy the really simple things get a packet of cut and come again salad leaves radishes are amazing and they're not all horrible and spicy like they used to be they're fantastic dipped in mayonnaise um, as a like a with a drink yes. um, and and buy um, a packet of annual seeds like calendula or um, love in the mist or so and just just go home and you know dig a little half inch trench and just put them into it cover it over water it and see what comes up and and, th- and bit by bit you will learn about the seasons and there is in fairness loads of fantastic information out there I mean the RHS go onto their website it's just some brilliant information there and lots of lovely info about what plants to put in for pollinators and you've got a big big plans announced at the chelsea flower show next week we have um and that's very exciting i'm very very pleased to be going i've been so many times over the years to the chelsea flower show and in fact i made quite a lot of documentaries there um, following show gardens o- over the years so it's lovely to be going back and to be involved so we're going to launch our pollinator action plan and actually i'm pleased to see that there's a big focus on pollinators at the show there are some show guns, even the, the BBC one included. That means bees, right? Bees it, is Well, it's is more than bees. See, I think people get hooked up that it's only about bees, but it really isn't. So pollinators include all insects that can help basically pollinate our crops. They want the plants for nectar. They go to the plants to get the nectar out because that's their fuel, it's their food. But in doing so, of course, the pollen brushes off on their bodies. Yes. They go into another plant and that's pollinating. So it's hoverflies, it's all flying insects, and certain insects prefer certain flowers. So it's, it's, it's the thousands and millions of insects that, in fact, they provide us free with this amazing pollinating service, which we need for our crops. And we think that's about a half a billion pounds worth of services <laughs> they provide free. us with free, which is why we need to look after them. Okay, good. And there's a plan for, plan for a, a public health engagement accord. It sounds very um, UN-like. It is, but it's actually very important. So another really key issue facing all our plants is this issue of diseases coming in from elsewhere, mm. basically threats. And we've seen it with um, the disease that's attacked our box plants. And, well, ash dieback is, mm. is you yeah. know, decimating vast tracts of our countryside and an awful lot of these diseases have come in on the back of other plants or Mm. maybe in the soil or in the roots and we actually pride ourselves in this country on our biosecurity already it's very very strict but we are upping the ante effectively and especially now that we've left Europe we need to make sure that our biosecurity remains 
even stronger. In a way, we're quite fortunate that we're an island mm. because the plants and diseases do have further to go. But that's why we also need to be really strict on what people bring in and out, a bit like they do in Australia and New Zealand as well, yep. very, very yep. strict on it. So xylella is a disease that everyone's talking about. Hard to say, hard to spell. But it's, it's, it's the big one. It's, it's the one that's wiping out olive trees in Europe, but it also attacks a lot of other species, and we really do so not want that So how are you stopping that going to Britain? Yes, yeah, so it's all about vigilance, it's all about knowledge, so we've been running workshops with groups, it's about um, inspections and knowledge, really, and having very, very strict protocol as to what can come in and out and what's an acceptable way of transporting plants. I would say one sort of good thing that comes out of that is that it's putting a lot more focus on what we grow at home mm. and, and how self-sufficient can we be, because even our landscape is in uh, Chelsea, for example, we have some amazing show gardens and often a lot of the uh, prize plants mm. are massive imported olive trees. That, do you remember course, in the past yeah. you've had a whacking great ancient 300-year olive tree has been the centre of a show mm. garden? That will have been imported. So now there's a lot more focus on what plants can we source at home. And in a way that's helping that's, to fuel our industry. Be. DEFRA here is putting money into and grants for a lot more work with forestry nurseries because we've got this big also target to treble our tree planting Mm. in this country. But also we want to help our horticultural industries. We're working with the ornamental plant industry, the horticultural trades industry, the edible plants group, so that we can have much more focus. Is it going to be a pivot back towards food security, do you think? Yes, well, we're already working really hard on that. Post-Ukraine. We we, we actually, we're 60% self-sufficient in in our food and 74% self-sufficient in certain crops and 100% in some things weirdly like Swedes, you know. <laughs> but we, we're really having a focus on trying to help the industry to become more innovative, use more tech. And I actually think our new gene editing bill that we heard about in the Queen's speech uh, just um, just recently, that's the kind of work that will help us to develop varieties that are more resistant to these pests and diseases, mm. more um, able to, to withstand them so that also we don't have to use so many pesticides. Is that a return to GMO crops can, here? It's it's gene editing, right, so it's a different, different it's a different thing. Um, editing modifier is quite similar to most people, but it's different. It's different. I would say it 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 doesn't have the worrying aspects that some of the other things have, and I, and I genuinely think this is a really useful way forward for us who want to become more self sufficient mm. and sustainable. And it's summer's coming. You're pushing ahead with uh, cleaning up the rivers. Yes. Which is a campaign the Telegraph is running at the moment, the Clean Rivers campaign. Oh, no, that's great. You've been yeah. seeing that. I mean, it's I important. Have. Are you a wild swimming yourself? Do you know or what? Or do you just swim? I've a, I'm not really... I, while swim in the sea, you're a wonderful swim in the sea. But I don't tend to swim in rivers. Why is that? Because you worry about the pollution? Yeah, I, I, I love walking by rivers. Well, to be quite honest, the rivers I know, they're quite exposed. So I suppose I don't want loads of people watching me diving <laughs> into the river. I did actually... We've just given the go-ahead for the next bathing areas, river areas, river quality areas, yes. one's in Oxford and one's on the Isle of Wight. And we're encouraging people to come forward with more applications for bathing water areas. And I did jokingly say to my press team, I don't, you're not going to tell me I've got to put on a swimming costume. <laughs> <laughs> and dive but you in. don't like while swimming because you... No, it's, it's not, not that I don't not, like it. It's not a pollution it's issue. It's not that I don't it? like it. No, it's, it's nothing to do with pollution because I love walking by rivers. I used to raft down rivers. I used to make these homemade rafts when I lived on at home on the farm out of old cans and you know strapped together um old bits of pallets of wood and you know i'd still do things like that have mm. picnics by rivers and uh, and we're doing a lot of work on rivers to put back the meanders in rivers yes, yes. to restore them back to their original state because that helps us with a lot of the flood yes. control slowing the flow no i mean our rivers are just a bit like gardens and nature they're one of those places that you just relax by and you love and you watch. Yeah, but I mean, fantastic that people love wild swimming. There's a huge surge in it. And I'm going to do everything I can as the water minister to clean up our rivers. And force these companies to start paying for it. I mean, they, Absolutely. they say they, we, they, they can't or they won't. No, or whatever. we're making no bones about that. And we are revolutionising the way we clean up our rivers in this government. No government has ever done as much as we're doing. And it is unacceptable, to be quite honest, what 
the water companies have got away with in terms of actually contravening the permits. Mm. They're, they're given permits not to do a lot of this stuff. And it's come to light through an intensive investigation we're doing with the Environment Agency that they are contravening their permits. And they know they know that action will be taken if they're found to have, co- you know, Mm. got to get all the data obviously but mm. what we're doing as well is they've now got to reduce all those use of storm sewage overflows dramatically and we're starting in the places where people swim where we've got protected sites with special wildlife and nature uh, so those would be the big focus yeah. first and that, but we've yeah. got to think about the cost to consumer as well because to eliminate them all would be astronomically expensive and some of them serve a useful purpose in yeah. emergencies because of, of course, climate change it's, over, you, it's, over, it's abusing that emergency and doing it all the time so it's getting four thousand right. a year or whatever the figure might yeah. be for so we're, but we're you know we're absolutely cracking down on that but we're also tackling other pollution in rivers because there's there's pollution from many other sources mm. whether it's urban diffuse pollution or it's agricultural pollution from nitrates phosphates yes. sediments so we're, we're tackling it from all angles. In, in, in last week's Queen's speech, there's also mention of cracking down on extinction rebellion, those kind of groups, and the way they protest. Are you at all sympathetic to what they're trying to do? Because your goal is also hit net zero, as their goal is. Yes, um, I, I think that all of those groups raise really important issues. And in fairness, when I was in my twenties, I was Greenpeace and Friends yes. of the Earth, and you know, anti-nuclear, which I'm not now. <laughs> um, you know, and I've, I've changed my views. But, so you understand but, why they do it? Do the you? protests. Oh, we're not stopping protests. Let me be absolutely clear about that. All this legislation is doing. I think it's just making protests sort of safer. It's just to stop that awful impact of, you know, people not being able to get to a funeral mm. or somebody died because they couldn't get to the hospital because the road was blocked. It's as simple as that, really. We're a democracy. People yes. can have their say. People can, you know, Your, march your, your in the colleague streets. Ben Goldsmith, who's on the board of the DEFRA, says he's quite supportive of what. Uh I think Ben, Extinction in fairness, re- s- retracted what, what he said. <laughs> it was a, a rogue tweet. So I hope I've explained clearly yes. what it is. We are not stopping protests. And just finally, you have um, written in your local paper about the HRT shortage. Yes. Why has that happened? Is it because men run politics and don't understand Ooh. the issue? No, I, I think I think what's happened even since I've been in Parliament, I do feel that a l- whole lot of subjects have come out into the open and are being addressed that we never talked about before or didn't talk about enough. And I just think, isn't that great? You know, and whether it's because we've got more women there now, I think that definitely has got something to do with it. But, you know, men are supporting us. And um, I think great to talk about these things. It's not a male blind spot, is it, HRT in policy? No, no, very definitely. And look, Sajid Javid, you couldn't have a better person uh, who's taken this on board and he's determined. And I think that the shortage arose because, of course, everybody is now able to access it. You know, and and, and I think it was also slightly taboo when people thought there was something wrong with using using them. But no, I think it's just brilliant that it's all out in the open. And we'll get the shortage will end soon. And we're tackling it. But you mentioned there um, women in politics. That's great. But do you worry about the culture in Parliament? I mean, is that, is that worrying you? There's the issue with MP who looked at um, images on his phone, this kind of thing, and then that, that meeting of the of the 2022 group at the Tory party talking about a culture issue. I mean, it's concerning. Well, probably is partly because we've now got more women in Parliament, and I would be the first person to try and encourage that, and I, I am. Uh, and uh, I think it's that we, what we want is a workplace that is is absolutely fit for purpose and is absolutely the way our top examples of workplaces operate. On that note, Rebecca Powell, head of Chelsea Flower Show, thank you for your tips on gardening, talking to the animals and the plants. Great to join us this week on Chopper's Politics. Thank you. Absolute pleasure as ever. Rebecca Powell there. Right, do stay with us, listeners. Coming up, I'll be talking to Rick Parry, chairman of the English Football League about whether it's an own goal to not include football when discussing levelling up. Right after this. If you're finding this podcast interesting, you may also like our new daily podcast, Ukraine, the latest. Every weekday, The Telegraph's leading journalists bring you the latest news and the most informed analysis of President Putin's invasion of Ukraine. From our newsroom in London 
and from the ground. The Russian machine has been ground to a halt now for well over a week, and that is just staggering. NATO has to act now. It has to do more than it's currently doing. Otherwise, in this Ukrainian MP's words, you'll have to evacuate the whole continent. One video that we found to be incorrect was bomb squads seen in the Donbass region. The metadata of this clip shows that it was created in 2019, not today. Search Ukraine, the latest, in the same place you're listening to this, and click follow so you don't miss an update. Now recently, there's been a battle in English football, with the English Football League arguing that the top flight Premier League needs to distribute more wealth to lower league clubs. Even those uninitiated in football would be hard-pressed to miss that this argument about moving resources from one rich area to a poorer one mirrors a political argument currently dominating discussions, levelling up. So I started by asking Rick Parry, the head of the English Football League, to tell me more about the role of lower league clubs in their communities and how they can help with the government's levelling up agenda. Rick Parry, welcome to Chopper's Politics. Thank you very much for the invitation. Great to be here. Now, listen, I was there at the EFL Community Awards on the terrace at the House of Commons a few weeks ago, and you said the following, it's a fundamental part of the government's levelling up agenda, pride of place and recognising our role in the community. And we, that's EFL, think we fit into that agenda pretty much perfectly. What has football got to do with levelling up? Uh, Because people care about football and people care about pride in place. We carried out a survey recently which suggested that 80% of constituents in Red Bull constituencies, not 80% of football fans, 80% of constituents recognised that their football clubs were very important to their communities. I mean, it's ready-made. You don't have to create new ideas to give pride in place. That's what football clubs give. And we see it graphically, of course, when they're under threat. We saw it with the unfortunate demise of Berry. We've seen lots of emotion around Derby County, mm-hmm. um, who are facing problems at the moment. It's, it's, it's very real. It's very tangible. We saw the positive examples during the pandemic, lots and lots and lots of examples of clubs and communities rallying together, providing practical help, providing emotional help. And, you know, it just showed, again, playing football in empty stadiums, brought it home, how much it matters to people that football thrives. Uh, And in terms of of football and politics, I do do think that... um supporting a local team doesn't almost imply a groundedness, doesn't it, amongst politicians in a community? You think how Alistair Campbell would always talk about Burnley, you know? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, from Alistair's perspective, he genuinely does care passionately about Burnley. Not every politician cares passionately about their clubs, but they do absolutely understand that the clubs matter to their constituents. And, you know, again, with with something like levelling up, which is really important, why try and invent new ideas if, if we have a fantastic idea that that's already there and proven? Have you been in touch with Michael Gove, the levelling up secretary? He introduced to Parliament the levelling up bill last week in, in the House of Commons. Um, no, we haven't spoken to Michael on this. We've been f- focusing our attention more on DCMS, but also on a lot of local MPs. We've had meetings with the Northern Research Group. We've spoken to lots of MPs in Red Wall constituencies. And I mean, lots of the EFL clubs, of course, sit in Red Wall constituencies. So yep. we, we think we have, a, we have a really interesting mix of clubs there. And, you know, the, the message really is we are supporting the fan-led review. We're supporting the need for change within football and and we do think government has a brilliant opportunity to secure the future of the game and to make clubs sustainable for the next 30 years and the answer to that you think is in a fan-led review you think yeah absolutely the answer is in redistribution and we've been pushing for redistribution for two years we haven't got anywhere and so when we engaged with Tracy in the fan-led review and and we enjoyed our engagement with Tracy we think she did a and her team did a great job in producing the fan-led review. 
I should clarify that Tracy is Tracy Crouch, of course, the former sports minister who authored uh, the fan-led review. Yeah, yeah, exactly. The point we made was very happy to embrace better financial regulation, greater transparency. We have no issue with that at all. In fact, we have been taking steps to, to improve what we do. But if it doesn't go hand in hand with redistribution, then we're all wasting our time. And, and, and that means more cash from the, from the top tier, does it, that term? Yeah, which, again, the government's response recognises is there's too great an imbalance. I mean, odd way of spending a bank holiday weekend, but I, I dug out the accounts from 1993 for the Premier League and the EFL. Back in 1993, the turnover of the Premier League was £45 million. The turnover of the EFL was £34 million. Mm. They were more or less the same, same order of magnitude. Since then, the turnover of the Premier League has gone up 68-fold. <laughs> the turnover of the EFL has gone up five and a half times. Gosh. So the, there is now a chasm between the two. That's the challenge. It's too big a challenge for clubs rising up the pyramid and falling down the pyramid. And we're not anti the Premier League. This is not the EFL against the Premier League. This is not the EFL putting its hands in the Premier League's pockets. This is about a sustainable pyramid. It's making clubs sustainable throughout the pyramid. We're cautiously optimistic and pleased by the government's response. We think it was a a well-written document in many ways. I think it was, it was considered, and I, and I think particularly the way that government justified their involvement in football and the introduction of a regulator was was very cogent. But our point is that if we don't achieve redistribution in parallel, then we're all wasting our time. And again, the government's response recognises that, but where, where we think it falls short is it leaves the responsibility for that back with the football authorities, which which is unrealistic because if it was going to happen, frankly, it would have happened a long time ago. So I think what we're saying is that to make sure that football clubs are sustainable, healthy, is going to do great things within those communities, prevent the angst that occurs when a, when a club is under threat, prevents the dissatisfaction when there are owners that, that people don't like. If, if we create healthy clubs, we believe that can go a long way towards creating healthy communities. And, and to be honest, this is a levelling up agenda, which is, isn't actually going to cost the government yeah. anything. So to- it's, it's very good value for government. I suppose the, the, the difference with levelling up is that some of those clubs you mentioned are in the south as well as the north, aren't they? Whereas levelling up is, 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 is tend to be the southeast against the rest of the country, whereas what you're describing there is an imbalance. I mean, there must be the clubs called Barnet or clubs in the south, of course, which are also um, are on their uppers. It's not really a geographical thing in the same way, is it? It's not quite a... Ge- no, it's not a geographical thing in the same way because we've got nothing against southern clubs. The point is that when we look at the constituencies that are most affected by levelling up, they tend to have an EFL club there. So we, mm. we do think it's highly relevant from, from that point of view. Yeah. Well, Rick Parry, the chairman of the English Football League, it's great when football meets with, um, with politics and a crunching tackle and all the best in your attempt at bringing levelling up to the football world. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. Thank you very much. Rick Parry there. Well, that's all for this week, listeners. Please do let me know your thoughts on what we've discussed today. What do you tell your plants? Do you speak to them like Rebecca Powell does? Email me, chopperspolitics at telegraph.co.uk or on Twitter, we're at chopperspodcast. Now, if you're not already a Telegraph subscriber, and if not, come on, why not? Have a treat on the Choppers Politics team. Go to telegraph.co.uk forward slash chopper. For your first month's access to our best political content and everything else the Telegraph can offer completely free of charge. Thank you once again to my guests, Rebecca Powell, MP, and Rick Parry. Thank you to my producers, Louisa Wells, Giles Gear, and Theodora Luludis. And as ever, thank you to you for listening. I'll be back, God willing, next week, so tune in then. And finally, please do buy a copy of a Daily Telegraph this weekend and every weekday. If you can, I know you won't regret it. Until next time, though, cheerio.